Hello and welcome to lecture two in advanced geomatics. Today we're going to be looking at ArcPy. Just a couple of reminders um, about your PyScriptor IDE. Um, when you start a new script in PyScriptor, remember it will look like this, and I'll show you an example. I'll go over here to PyScriptor. So when you start up PyScriptor, it shows you all this information and just delete all that stuff for now. We don't have to worry about that stuff right now um, until we create classes and whatnot. So that's the first thing. Next, we have some IDE options that will help out with programming or scripting inside Python within the IDE rather than in ArcGIS Pro. And that's just to ensure that you have that special packages in the IDE options explicitly saying ArcPy, OS comma ArcPy. So again, that's here in Tools, Options, IDE Options. And then in here, um, under Code Completion, make sure that you have typed ArcPy. Now, if you followed all the stuff in the setup uh, tutorial that I have, you should have all these things, but just a reminder, it doesn't hurt to check them. So Special Packages OS will be there and then comma, you type in ArcPy. Next, we want to make sure that when we look at the IDE options, the Python interpreter, that you check off the reinitialized before run. Because by default, that's on and it's true, reinitialize before run. So we go back to our tools, options, IDE options, it's under Python interpreter, there we go. And then see this one here, reinitialize before run. By default, that's on. And that will slow down debugging of scripts significantly because every time you run some code, it reinitializes a new Python instance. So turn it to false and click OK. So make sure you have that off. And that'll just make things smoother in the PyScript or IDE. So a bit of setup stuff. So what is ArcPy basically? ArcPy is the library of functions, basically the package is called a site package type of thing for Python. And it contains all of the tools that we see in our toolbox, as well as non-tool tools and classes that allow us to control any type of analysis that we want to do through Python with, and have it run in ArcGIS using those ArcGIS tools. For example, here, we have clip, a clip tool, for example, that's a toolbox tool. And so there's going to be a clip function in ArcPy, which is the Python equivalent to that toolbox. And the clip tool asks for input features, clip features, and output features, like you see here. And it has a syntax that we can look at. For example, click on the question mark here for any tool, and it will show you what the necessary things are for Python. So if I go back, if I just go over here to ArcGIS Pro, for example, and I already have some data in here from this exercise or from this module, and I go over to geoprocessing and I go back to toolboxes, and I go to the top here for analysis tools, for example, extract, and there's clip. If I open up the clip tool, there's a question mark. This question mark, when you click on it, will open up a browser window and bring you to the help file for that particular function. And as you scroll down, once you know how it works, you scroll down and you see the syntax. And it says arcpy.analysis.clip. That tells us that this is in the analysis um, package of ArcPy. So it's a sub package or library called analysis. And inside analysis is the clip um, method or function. And then it says the in features down here, it explains always what they are. These are the features to be clipped. And what does it expect? Well, it expects a feature layer. So to make this work, we have to put a feature layer in place of in features. Clip features. Here are the features used to clip the input features. So think of a cookie cutter. That's the clip features. And that also needs to be a feature layer. And whatever clip features is will replace clip features here. So whatever layer you choose it to be will go in place of clip features. 
and then out feature class, which is the new one to be created. And that's a feature class. However, it's one that you type in as a name. So you just type the name of the output feature class. Well, sometimes those aren't obvious and you have to know how to read them. Well, if it's an output, because it says out here, out feature class, and it's a feature class to be created, and the data type is feature class, well, obviously it'll just be a name that you type in this case. So the syntax of functions look like this. So every function or every tool has a syntax. Syntax simply means the structure or grammar of the language, in this case, Python. So clip, it might say something like clip underscore analysis, and we'll see the different ways of calling functions in a bit. So that's the name of the tool function, as we just saw. The names of the things in parentheses are called parameters. They are used within the code of the tool itself to do manipulations with whatever data you set them to be. So for example, in features, you might set that to be a polygon feature class, something that has polygons like um, census tracts or eco zones or anything like that. So the parameters are what the tool uses and we have to set the parameters for it to work. Some are required. All required parameters have no braces around their names. So in features, clip features and out features are required parameters. That means we must specify something in our GIS session or in our GIS database to set equivalent to those parameters there. Any parameters that are in squiggly braces like cluster tolerance are optional. That means that the tool will run without them. It does not mean that you're doing it correctly. So in this case, the optional one is cluster tolerance for this one. You must know what that means to figure out whether or not this particular function should be using that in some, with some particular number that you want to know whether or not it will be correct. So required ones mean that the function will not work without it. Optional parameters, these are optional, but may be necessary for the type of output that you want to have happen. So the optional. And of course, as I mentioned, the expected data type for each parameter is specified under the data type column. And sometimes, again, remember, if it's an output of some sort, the whatever it says here will be a string, something you type in like my output in quotes or something like that. You'll get a hang of it as we do many of these examples. So a geoprocessing tool then has a fixed set of parameters as we saw, and these provide the tool with the information it needs to operate and create an output. The tools usually have input parameters that define the data sets or type of input data types, feature class or number or whatever that are typically used to generate the new output data. And the parameters have several important properties. Each expects a specific type of data, such as a feature class, integer, string, or raster, um, or number for that matter. And if you put the wrong one in, it will not work. You'll get a uh, syntax error of some kind. The parameter expects either an input or an output value. So parameters can be inputs, so the tool can work. And depending on the type of tool, it could modify the data itself that you input, or it creates a separate output. And so you have to specify that. That'll be specified in the parameter list. And parameters are either required or optional. Each tool parameter has a unique name. So each parameter will have a unique name, and they're usually named to give you some idea of what that input parameter should be. Like in features means in feature class, an input feature class. When a tool is used in Python, its parameter values must be correctly set to what we call arguments. Arguments are the things we send in place of the parameter names, like in underscore features would be a parameter like we saw, or in clip features parameter, 
And we'd set that to a specific output or specific um, uh, layer, feature layer or feature class. Once the, I should say, once a, once a uh, valid set of parameter arguments are provided, the tool will be executable and ready to, to be used in Python. And the parameters are specified either as string or object arguments. So one of the two usually, or numbers, which are also objects as are strings. So they're all object arguments, strictly speaking. So here's a clip function example. So here I have, um, I'm gonna look at uh, two layers. We have truck routes and a polygon. And I'll show you what they look like in ArcGIS Pro. They look like this. So there's a polygon right there. And that's a truck route. So here we have the truck routes and a polygon. And what we want are to clip the truck routes with this polygon. So we just have truck routes within this neighborhood. So to do that in Python, in the external IDE, first we import ArcPy, and then we must import the ENV. So ENV is the environment settings, and we'll see those in more detail in a bit. The environment settings are important because they allow us to tell the script, which is outside of ArcGIS Pro, where to find those data or feature class layers. For example, here, I put on my in temp, I made a data folder, and then inside the Ottawa GDB feature data set called data are the feature classes, truck routes, a polygon. And then I also need an out feature class right here. And I call it here clipped FC and it's called routes in a poly. And that will, once I run this, so I say arcpy.clip analysis, for example, my in feature class is right here. Let's erase some of these so they make a, doesn't make too much of a mess up here when we're looking at things. So in FC goes there. Clipped FC goes next. And then clipped FC, which is the output, goes right there. And see that it's just a, all of these are just strings that refer to specific names of feature classes. So doing that example, We'll go over here to PyScripter and I'll say import ArcPy. And again, that first import always takes a, a few seconds. And then I'll say from ArcPy import ENV. That's the environment settings. And I'll just show us that we have no workspace right now. I'll say print, print here, env.workspace, for example. And when I run this code, that first run takes a second or two, it says none. So it printed out none for the workspace. So we need to set that workspace manually. And if I go to my C drive here, temp, and then way down here, I have a data folder right there. And that's the data for this module. So inside data, I see the Ottawa GDB or geodatabase, and I don't see anything else in there. I can't, this stuff makes no sense to me. That is all stuff which is part of the geodatabase, which will look like a geodatabase in ArcGIS Pro. So we need to look at that in ArcGIS Pro. So going over to Pro, this is what that data folder looks like. I imported it into folders and it looks like this. So I have Ottawa GDB data and then a number of feature classes. And there's also a Ottawa data feature data set with feature classes in there. So I can see them all here and we'll see how we can uh, at least see the, the names of them without going into ArcGIS Pro in the future, but we'll do that a bit later. So these names are the names of the feature classes. So to find that workspace, one easy way to get the workspace rather than uh, typing it in manually is to simply go here, for example, and copy it from Windows Explorer. Or, and if I, then I can paste it into, oops, the wrong one there. Or I can, then I can paste it there and say env.workspace equals, and then in quotes, that see temp data, 
and then I'd have to type in Ottawa GDB like so. So that then sets the workspace. Now, if I run this and I'll just check in my console down here, I'll say env.workspace so I don't have to type a print statement. There it is, it's set, now it's set to that. C temp data Ottawa, Ottawa GDB. Now, one issue we might, we might find here is that see that notice there's double slashes. So double backslashes and a single black slash here. So this is a Windows path. So I must put an R in front of it like so. So I'll run that again and then I'll check the workspace. And notice now it fixes that and puts double backslashes everywhere. So it's an important thing to remember that if you copy paths from Windows Explorer into R, into um, Python, and you want to use them with ArcGIS Pro, you have to make sure to make it a, a literal to tell Python that the backslashes are not escape characters, but path separation characters. And you do that by putting a little R in front of the path, which is in quotes. The other way to get that particular workspace is to go to the analysis tab in ArcGIS, open up your Python window, and you can just drag in to the Python line, the command line, Ottawa GDB, and it gives you the path to it. And I can just copy and paste that directly like that into ENV workspace. So I'm assigning that as the workspace. And because it's done that way, and I got it through the Python window in ArcGIS Pro by dragging it from the table of contents, I should say from the um, uh, contents, not contents, but the catalog view, right to, to the command line here. It's already has the right double um, backslashes like so, which Python requires. So next up, I wanna specify my feature classes. So my, if I go and look, let's do this systematically, go over and we'll look at the clip function again. So the clip function requires in features, clip features and an out feature class the in features of the things to be clipped. So those would be our truck routes that we see in ArcGIS Pro. So those are the truck routes that we see there. We wanna clip those to the neighborhood. So I go back in and I'll make a variable to hold the name of those truck routes. So, and we'll call them um, by the name here. So in features, the features to be clipped, which will be the truck route still. So we'll say the in, in features like this, or in input features, make it really explicit. And I'll say that's equal to the name of that layer, which is truck route. So I'll check the name over here. So it's truck routes underscore. Like so. And then clip features. And you can use mixed camel case here. Generally, what we call this, what we call camel case is, is reserved in Python for methods. Um, but you can also use them for variable names. But generally in Python, uh, you would you would use underscores instead to separate things to make variables. So I'd say features to be clipped. So that's a long name, but it's very explicit, isn't it? And I separated them with underscores. So features to be clipped, and those will be the well, that's the input features actually. So I, I should I should have just called that features to be clipped. So I'll just bring Chuck Routes back down here like so, make it more explicit. So features to be clipped instead of input features. And then the next one is the features that will be 
used as a cookie cutter. So I'll just call them the cookie cutter features. FC for feature class. And that will be a polygon. That's what it was called. Then my output features. I'll just call those output features like so. So output features equals, and we said we would call those, let's just check back over here, routes in a poly. So we'll stick with that. Routes in a poly, like so. And I'm just not putting in the, um, just for sake of time and whatnot, I'm not putting in all of the comments, but these are the arguments. Now, I can go up here and I'm going to import, I'm going to say from arcpy.analysis import all. So I can just call the clip directly. And I'll just run this first. And that's just to make sure that it imports the analysis toolbox. So I can call clip directly. And here I'll say, um, and I can save this in a variable. It's called a result variable. I'll call it clipped, clipped FC equals clip. And it brings up, of course, the context sensitive um, completion and syntax. So clip analysis in features, clip features out feature class. So that's the order, right? So our features to be clipped are first. So I'll say features to be clipped. And notice it starts to spell it right away. And I just hit tab to finish the, so I don't have to type the whole thing in again. Then cookie cutter, FC, tab, as soon as it shows up. And finally output features, tab, and that's it. So now I'll run this again. I don't want to select it. I'll just run the whole thing. And we'll look inside this workspace right here. So inside this workspace, that's where things will be saved. So into, inside of Ottawa GDB, if I go over here, now back to ArcGIS Pro, and I have to refresh it. And there it is, it's inside the geo database, Ottawa GDB routes in a poly. If I just drag them and drop them in here, I can see them. And I'll turn off truck routes and I'll turn off the topographic map. And now we have the neighborhood with the truck routes just in the neighborhood, clipped. Now I wanna change the, the way that looks, maybe that's a major road. So I'll put a, just put a different symbol on it, a major road symbol something that's more contrast like anyway the red one's good there we go you can see it easily now and so the output here oops the output here was saved in our workspace and that's why we need to have a workspace both to find the data and a place for the data to be output now we just saw how we called that function so if we look back at that function here we said clip, and then we put in our variable names. We did not put in the names as specified here. We didn't say in features equals features to be clipped. We didn't say clip underscore features equals cookie cutter FC and out underscore feature underscore class equals out features because Python knows that the order that you give the arguments are assigned to the argument parameters in the order in which they're given. So if I put, if this is the right thing, if that's the feature class that is going to be clipped, then it knows that that is the in features right here. And there's different ways we could have called that function. So calling a function is simply using a function. So the function call simply means to execute the function like we just did with the clip. So 
we used implicit. So the general way was implicit um, argument parameter assignments, where we just put in to clip analysis our in feature class clip FC and clipped FC. We could have also specified the same thing, but put none, the word none, as the last optional argument. Why is that useful, you say, if we're not using it? Well, it's useful ourselves to remind us when we're maybe reviewing this code or getting results that do not um, match what we thought they should, that there is a third or a fourth parameter that we did not use. So maybe using that or checking out what it actually specifies could be useful for us. So having none for unused parameters can be useful that way for optional ones at the end. So import uh, in call clip. So notice here, we did arcpy clip underscore analysis, arcpy.analysis.clip. And then we have, when we import the analysis, we can just say analysis.clip. So these are the way of calling the functions here. So clip analysis, all, and all would work. Now, from ArcPy import analysis, then we have to the analysis clip. If you don't do that, then you always have long um, chains with a dot, meaning uh, dot method, dot method, or dot function, dot function, however you want to call it. So ArcPy.clip analysis could be, would work. ArcPy.analysis.clip would work. If we import the analysis module, into Python, like using that statement, then we can just say analysis.clip, which shortens it a bit. Um, or as we did, we said from ArcPy import analysis is A. Oh no, we didn't. This is a, sorry, this is the what one, two, one, two, three, this is the fourth way. We import the analysis module as a smaller um, thing to type, like A or AN, for example. Something that, well, maybe not AN, but um, a N L or something like that. We're just a for analysis. Then we say a dot clip. And finally, the way we, we did it, we imported all, well, that should be a small F there, uh, from arcpy dot analysis import all. So we imported all the functions in the analysis toolbox. So we could just type clip instead of having to type these longer, um, names for that same function. And there's advantages and disadvantages to, to either any of these. The advantages of using something like this, arcpy.analysis.clip, for example, means that you don't have to import the analysis module, so you have fewer imports. It also reminds you when you're reviewing your code where this function comes from, because you'll know then it comes from the analysis toolbox. Whereas if you have, if you just import everything from a toolbox like clip, um, you might not know later on somewhere during the code that clip is from which toolbox is you can often import many toolboxes like that. Like you could do management tools, arcpy.management, import all, mapping, arcpy.mp, import all. And then you have a whole bunch of function you can use by name, but you're never sure where they're coming from. Any way you want to do it is fine, but notice there's five ways to call the same function. So back here, that just means that I, I could have, just to show you, and I'll do this. Um, I, can't, I, can't, I can't have the output, I'll have to call that poly A, for example, because I already have it in ArcGIS Pro in a map. So once that's in a map, it puts a lock on that file and I would get an error if I try to rerun it, watch. So this would be something useful to see. So I'll try to rerun this whole thing and it gives me this error return lambda args val. So when that thing shows up in base Python, so that's the Python, the base Python of ArcPy or of the, for ArcPy or whatever. And then it says here, uh, the last again, as I mentioned before, the last line of those errors are usually the most informative. Output feature class data set already exists, failed to execute clip. And that's because it's inside of ArcGIS Pro right now. So ArcGIS Pro has a file lock on that file. 
I cannot, until I close ArcGIS Pro, um, do anything. I can't even rewrite it right now because of that file law. So I have to give it a different name, like A, if I want to run it again. So I could have done this. This is just to show different ways of importing. So I don't import analysis at all. And instead down here, I type in, you know, arcpy, since it's already imported, dot analysis, dot clip, like so. And that would then create do the same thing with no errors in this case because I changed the name of the output. Another thing that you might want to have at the in your scripts and you'll see more of this later is uh, env dot overwrite output equals true. That way I could run this again without having to rename the output. Even though it already exists, it will just be overwritten. Like you see there. So it's finished running again, nothing happens down here, but we don't get that error that we saw before. But even if you have overwrite output equals true, like I have here, and at the same time you have that layer that you're trying to write over, inside a ArcGIS Pro map, you will get a, a file lock error. So keep that in mind. So generally, you know, the reason I'm showing ArcGIS Pro open at the same time is to show the results right now for learning purposes, but generally um, you would check them um, intermittently. So five ways to call that function, all are good. Now, there's also a number of ways to specify parameter arguments. So the implicit way is what we use. And you'll see in most scripts, except perhaps for some scripts produced by Arc, um, by Esri, the makers of ArcGIS Pro, for example. But generally, we just put in the arguments in the order in which they occur for the parameters that they apply to. So in FC, if that's a variable that refers to a feature class to be clipped, well, that goes there. We just, that's the name of the variable. We don't specify the name of the parameter it applies to, it will automatically be assigned to that parameter because of the order in which it occurs, one, two, and three. So that's our, our usual way. Um, the optional argument, none. So for missing parameters or parameters that are optional that you're not using, you can put the word none there as we saw, and I mentioned already talked about it previously. ArcPy analysis clip, and then here we have in features. So the name of the parameter is assigned the argument explicitly. So this is called named parameters. And once we start naming them, we have to keep naming them throughout. So I can't just name the first one and decide to use the order of appearance for the next ones. I must name each of them. In features, clip features equals clip FC, out features class equals clipped FC. And these uh, again, clip FC, in FC, clipped FC are just um, uh, variables that hold strings that specify the actual names of the inputs. We can have implicit and name parameter arguments with optional name parameter set to none. So this is the same as this one here, but explicitly setting the parameter name as none. Here is one that would provide an error. Because remember I set up here that if we use name parameters, once we start using name parameters, we must continue for all parameters. This one here, I have named the first parameter, but not the second one or the, and I named the third one. So I will get an error if that happens. Then error will be a keyword argument after an implicit parameter argument assignment. So when you get that error, you know that you named something and then stopped naming the parameters and their arguments. So that's not allowed. Now, this one is okay because once I started to name them, I only started the first, the second, are by order, but then the third one I named and that's okay. 
because as long as I would keep naming arguments further, that would be fine. If I don't use the arguments, I don't have to name them obviously, but that's okay as well like this, that's okay. Because the rule is once you start naming parameters, you must continue in naming parameters. So lots of ways to call the functions as well. You can choose whatever way you feel is best. Mostly implicit assignment is what is used in all the examples, slides and exercises. Now, what is a result object? A result object is what is returned from a tool when it's run. So whenever you run a tool like the clip, like we did here. So here we have the clipped FC is holding the result of the clip function. So clipped FC right here is a result object. So what is a result object? Well, the result object contains a reference to the actual feature class that was created, for example. So I could use it in other functions by name. So if I wanted to then uh, use those clipped features and buffer them, well, I could just buffer. I could say, okay, let's create a buffer. Um, I'd have to import from analysis up here, just as an example. I'd say from arcpy.analysis import all. And then I could say here, um, buffered equals buffer in features. And I can say my result object here, clipped FC, just as if it was a feature class. And then my output feature class, I don't have to give it a name. I'll just give it one in here. Um, well, that's not a good name actually, a buffer. And then uh, how many? I want to go with 100 map units, 100 meters. And lots and lots of, um, lots of uh, the, um, what should I say? The, the arguments here are optional. So these are the three required ones. So when I run this, I'll have to go look for a buffer. There it is, it's finished. If I go over to my Pi, uh, Arc Pro and I go into the catalog and I look for the Ottawa GDB. I have to refresh it to see it and there's a buffer. So I can bring in my buffer now. And there's the buffer around those um, segments. I should have dissolved them. There's lots of, buffer has a lot of uh, optional arguments that you can control how the buffers come out. So these are called sausage buffers when they're around linear features, by the way. So that's one use of the result object is as a layer, as a feature class in other functions like those. So, so clipped FC was a result object that is used directly as if it was a feature class that could be buffered with the buffer function. Now, result objects themselves have more uses in that they have all the information about what happened during your particular run of the tool or function. And these are some of the re results here. So the tool name, for example. So if I go back over here and I'll just go in my console down at the bottom here and I'll say, um, Buffered, that's also a, a new one, dot tool name, dot um, get input, for example. Ooh, it's just a property. So it shows us the, the input uh, result is there. There's the result and it says the input is a buffer. I could say buffered dot um, get messages. So any messages that were provided. So I could say that, and that gives me a result of messages. So let, let's see what, what is the first one? Um, no, it's not subscriptable. 
I should just, is it a, there we go. It's a method. So uh, buffer.get messages, start time, end time, etc. And so there's a number of other ones. So input count, result ID, which tells us whether or not it worked or not. Then you could look that up. The result IDs are a standard set of um, or things for the, the tell you uh, that you can save for reference further on. It's not something we're going to deal with. Um, the input count, max severity, message count, result ID again, status. So for example, um, if you're running a long process, you want you might have a script to check the status, you know, to see if it's new, succeeded, executing, for example, would be three, succeeded would be four. So let's see what our um, status was for buffered. So status, four. Four corresponds to succeeded, like we see here. So you can get a lot of information from there. And then these methods, yeah. So the methods then are down here. Cancel, so you could cancel one programmatically if you needed to. Um, any other get messages we saw? Get output. Severity and save to file. And that just saves the result object to a file, not the actual uh, layer that you might be creating, which is a feature, feature class or something. So tool functions return result objects. So that's what you need to remember. Every tool function returns a result object. Here example, clip result is a result object. I can get messages from the result object as I showed. Um, I could get the path to the clipped output. So I can say get output zero. Didn't try that one, but I could show you buffered dot get output or what is it called there, uh, get output, yeah, get get output, and then in parentheses, zero, and that's just the full path to the output. And that can be handy in some cases. Maybe you wanna save those to a text file or something. And we can get the status as we saw, and we saw that we got a four for the buffer, and that was that means it executed. So that's good to see. And then uh, we know, as I mentioned, that the result object can be used in other in place of a input parameter in any function that would take that type of um, the type of thing that was created. So we created a vector feature class first, right, which was a clipped bit of roads, and then we buffered that. And so since buffer buffer requires an input feature class, the previous result object pointed to a feature class, which was the clipped roads that could then be buffered. So we can use it that way. Now, there's a lot of non-tool functions that don't res return result objects. And we'll see like, uh, for example, list functions, functions that just do things to help other functions in ArcGIS, probably like validating names of tables, um, and stuff like that. So there's a there's a number of functions that do not return result objects. Only tool functions return result objects. So something that's a tool that's being run. Otherwise, the other things return specific things. It could be Boolean values or a number or something like that. Exist is a important function in ArcPy, and it's one of the functions that does not return a result object. All it simply does is ensure that a particular data set exists prior to being used. So for example, here we have our regular import statements and environment settings. And then inside this particular geodatabase feature data set called data, we determine if these layers exist. We say arcpy.exists neighborhoods, and that returns a true or false. Likewise, arcpy exists truck routes, true or false. So we can see if something exists prior to running code on it so that the code itself that we want to run the script doesn't fail because something is not there that you would expect to find. Here's an example of using exists. 
And it's just a extension of what we just did. The idea here is that we see if the two layers that we want to use for the input feature class to be clipped and the cookie cutter clipping features, if they exist, and we just save them in variables here, then before running clip, we say if they both exist, if layer A, I'll just clean this off a bit here. So if layer A, which is seeing if it, the input features exist and layer B, so that's a called a um, conditional operator. Um, and then we have a, a, a conditional statement, I should say here, that returns either true or false. Both the right and left must be true for any of the code in here to run right there. So if they both exist, then do the clip. That's what we're doing there. And I just make, we just print out a little message here that yes, they both exist. If one or the other or both do not exist, then it prints out error. That they don't exist. It gives a little bit of information there. So let's look at that example just briefly over here in PyScripter. So I'm going to remove the buffering stuff. We don't need it. And I'm going to just put a bit of space between the clip function and the, and I'll make this a bit smaller as well. A bit of space between the clip function where we do the clipping in analysis.clip. And I'll just put that back to clip since we have the import of everything from analysis up here. So I'll make a uh, two variables, left, I'll just call it left, no, let's call it um, um, a equals arcpy.exists features to be clipped and b equals arcpy.exists the cookie cutter feature class, like so. So these will return a true or a false. So let's just, I'm just gonna comment out that line of code, which does the clipping, and I'll just run those and I'll check the values of A and B. So I run my whole, my whole thing with the last line, which does clipping, um, comment it out. And then once I run it, then I can check what A and B are in the console. A is true and B is true in this case. What if I had that up there? So I misspell the name of one of the feature classes. Now, if I run it, A is true and B is false because B right here, this line is looking for something called a polygons, which doesn't exist. If I put it back to a polygon, of course, then A and B are both true. Then a conditional statement such as A and B, so I'll just put and B just on the console here to show you, that will return true. So that just means true and true, like so, that they won't do, is true. If I say false and true, as if one of the things did not exist of the classes, this will hold the this um, conditional statement will evaluate to false, like so. So then what we do here is before clipping, we would say, okay, we put a flow control statement using if, if A and B, and we need to put those in parentheses, we don't have to, but it's a good idea too. If A and B B, then, and then we indent clip. We end up indent the clipped here. And anything afterwards to do with clipped, the other, uh, let's say we want to print a message, we'd say print. I'll just put in here, I'll make a, oops, 
make a um, quotes. successfully um, ran, like so. So I'll print that out. Otherwise, I'll say else print simply here um, without the, the, the ones on the slider, a little more fancy printing, but that's fine. Um, here I'll say one or more of the inputs does not exist like so. So now if I run this, it will print out that. The entire thing now, including the clipping, it says the function successfully ran. If I had a misspelling, like a polygon with another a there and I run the script, it says one or more of the inputs does not exist. So the existence, the exists function is important in that regard when you are creating a script or program, especially when you're going to be giving it to other people to check whether or not the, the, the layers actually are there or not. Because you can't see them in Python, right? So we need to check that they're there before using them. Now, sometimes you don't have to, especially when we're making a, when we, we look at making what's called script tools, where the existence is predicated on the tool itself in ArcGIS Pro. So we don't have to use exists in our code because we can't actually get a run here. Or we can't get past the tool itself unless we have all the inputs which are required being specified in ArcGIS Pro. We'll see that a little bit later on in the course though. So. We also have classes and objects. So classes are the things, again, other things in ArcGIS Pro ArcPy that don't return a result object. And there's a list of them here. And a class, if you're not familiar with, is just an analogous to an architectural blueprint. So you remember the example in the first lecture with the waiter and everything and the restaurant. That, that's, a, for example, a class specification that could be then instantiated for a particular restaurant or any particular restaurant, once it exists, it has all those properties and methods, you know, to make stuff in the kitchen or in the bar or interact with the interfaces of the wait staff, for example, or the manager. Um, and classes, as I said, we have instantiate them. They, once we have an instance of a class, we have an object and we call that an instance. So instantiation. ArcPy classes, such as spatial reference and extent are often used as shortcuts to complete geoprocessing tool parameters that would otherwise have more complicated string equivalents. So the class called spatial reference, an ArcPy class or extent, are there and have a number of properties to make it easier to create a spatial reference object, for example, like NAT83, UTM zone 18, where Ottawa is, for example or otherwise. And there's many other ones like cursor and we'll, we'll see these. So I don't expect you to know everything I'm saying now, just realize that there are classes that make it easier to interact with or create complex objects in ArcGIS Pro. Cursor is a class which we use to iterate over objects in layers. The environment class that you've already seen. So we need to use environment classes whenever we have a standalone script to say what the workspace is, for example, or to specify it's okay to overwrite things. And there's extent, there's fields, so field objects, field mapping, field maps, geometry, a very important one, which we'll spend a lecture on. So there's a number of them that are exposed by ArcPy that we can use and they don't return result objects. And then you won't ever see these things um, necessarily in the interface of ArcGIS Pro because they're only used in the context of programming. Now, classes have what are called properties and methods. So some have only properties and some have only methods. Some have both. A property is an attribute of a class. So once a class, when you're making an object, it will have attributes. For example, a point, for example, object would have an X and a Y property. You're simply something that is describing the object according to what it should be. 
for example, you have names, for example, and they're properties. So that's a property of you, your height, your hair color, et cetera, are properties. They don't do anything. They just exist as they are. And they make you unique as an object or a person, obviously. But in programming language, you, you could be an object in that sense. And then we have methods as well. Methods are things that an object can do. Using the person analogy again, things that you could do would be like uh, pick up a book. That's a met that could be a method or move 10 steps. That's a method of an object like a person if a person was an object. And I'm not saying here people are objects by any means. Of course, a person is far more um, intricate and is not an object in, in the sense of things. It's just a good analogy. That's all. So methods do things. For example, an important class called the cursor class has a method called next. And that moves it to the next thing. So a cursor is basically something that points to each row in a table or each object or spatial object in a feature class. And we can say next to go to the next one in the list of objects that make up that feature class. And that's a method like pick up a book would be for a person. So many of these classes, all these classes will have either properties or methods, some both in many cases. The environment class ENV has all these ones. And you can see this list by simply saying for I, the iterator variable in arcpy.list environments, a listing function, print I and just prints out all of the properties of a spatial reference, or I should say of environments, not the environment class. So things we see, we have already know like uh, workspace, for example, is in here. Scratch workspace right there. Output coordinate system is where you could set a spatial reference, the reference scale of the map, the tolerance, the extent, uh, there's workspace. So those are all the properties of an environment, of the environment, geoprocessing environments. And they're all available to be set or checked out and read in Python. So the environment class has many properties. Some are read, write, or get set, depending on what you want to call it. So read, write means that a property can be queried and set or written, overwritten. Like, for example, workspace. We've already done that a couple of times. When I say, when I type uh, env.workspace and I get nothing at the beginning because there's no workspace, that's getting or reading the property. And then when I set the workspace to a particular path, that's writing or setting the property. And then there's some that are read only. And properties always specify in the help file whether they're read, write, or read only. So some will just say read. And some will just say write. So in the environment class, for example, add outputs to map, you can get the property to see what it is, or you can set it. We can set it to false. We can get a workspace and then see what it is, if it actually has been set, or we can set it to a particular path like that. And notice here, this path is four slashes, not backslashes, which are okay. So the default environment properties are set based on you know, what you find often in the environment window. So when you create a script tool, so not a script like we're running them right now outside of ArcGIS Pro, but a script tool, environments can be set in the software and your tool will um, follow those environment settings. And when you set properties in Python in ArcGIS, they only apply to the script itself. So when we run a script, if we have specific environment settings that we want in our script, they will only exist as long as the script runs. They will not affect any of these settings in the actual software itself. And if properties are set in the Python window, um, they only apply in the Python window in ArcGIS Pro. And finally, it's a good idea to um, reset environments if you're going to be changing maps and locations. 
So again, here, just an example of setting property value, add outputs to map to false, setting a workspace, resetting environments afterwards. And that just resets everything to the default values and would get rid of that. I mean, it would erase that. It would erase whatever the default here is, would, it would put that back in. So ArcPy reset environments can be used in the Python to reset all the environment settings. So you can ensure they're all erased and not going to affect your analysis. Now, in the case here, when we're doing scripts, standalone scripts like this, we don't need to reset environments because the environment settings like this path uh, only exist when the script is running. There's no need to reset them or anything. It's only when you're working in the window in ArcGIS Pro that you need to reset them uh, sometimes. To paths, so the types of paths that are usable in ArcGIS Pro are any path that has a um, four slash like this. So I can create paths like that and not have to put an R in front of them or anything. And ArcGIS Pro is fine with paths like this. So this here is a path to a feature data set. And then here within that feature data set to a feature class. You can also just reference feature classes in any geo database without reference to the feature data set that they are a part of. So you can always leave that out if you just want to get that feature class because part of a geo database specification is there can be no two um, layers with the same name within the same geo database. So they're unique. So a catalog path in ArcGIS, catalog paths are what we use when referencing data. So we call them catalog paths. And it's composed of a couple of things, a base name. So that's the catalog path. We have a workspace, which is the geo database. And then a base name, which is, could be a feature class sometimes, or it could be in this case, a feature data set. And each part of the path has a data type that you can determine using the describe function in ArcPy. So for more about the types of paths that are allowed, see the, uh, just go to ArcGIS help and then search for this term, setting paths to data in Python. It will show you all the different types of path, the three types of paths that are supported. So it's a, a good thing to remember how to create paths to data. Because if you use that single um, uh, backslash, you will always get problems unless you put in an R for literal, not an escape character. What is an escape character? Well, um, in programming languages in or in certain ASCII character sets, the, the escape character means literal. So you often have like escape 242 to create a particular type of character. So it's a special, has a special meaning. And that's why the backslash, single backslash has a special meaning and it just means whatever next, literally. And that's why we can't use it as a separate, single separation character between paths and windows, the windows operating system. So here, for example, I can describe paths. We'll just do a little example of that in console down here. X equals arcpy.describe. And then a path. Let's just put here env.workspace. So X is now a describe object. I can say X dot, for example, data type. X dot data type workspace. The current one here is a workspace. If I was to try a different path, I'll just go back here and I'll say instead of env.workspace, I'll just put an actual path. I'll say c temp, uh, what was it? c temp data ottawa.gdb slash data, like so. I should say slash data, which we know is a feature data set. And if I say X dot data type again, that's it, tells me it's a feature data set, quite handy. Um, if I go a bit further, data slash um, a polygon, 
And I say, okay, what is the data type? Feature class. So the describe object on a path can tell you whether the path is referencing a feature class or just a workspace or something that's not a feature class or raster, for example. And that can be handy in when you're programming, you know, to say, okay, you want to make sure to check that uh, certain things are of a certain data type. Well, you can use the describe object for that, as long as you have the path to the object. So if something is a feature class, then go ahead and use the clip function, for example. If one of the inputs is not a feature class, don't. So the describe object then has a number of properties. Here are some of the basic ones, so the base name, catalog path. Um, sub elements, which provide more describe objects if they're, if they're there. And a bunch of other ones we, we're not going to even be looking at. Data type, file name, um, and path usually are used. But the describe object is there for use. And it takes any path and will give you the ability to figure out what the data type is or what the name is and, or break up that path in a certain way. So for example, here, specific data types will have more properties and methods. So if um, on my describe object, I get a feature class, well, I could then look up here, feature class properties, and there'll be more. So all these ones, plus any properties that are specific to a feature class that are then through the describe object. So if I go, for example, here to the, to the help file, and I'll just go up at the top and I'll, in ArcGIS Pro Help, I'll type describe, like so. And it gives me describe ArcGIS Pro documentation. And if I go down, there's the basic describe object properties in the first item. So all describe objects have those properties. Then, if I'm interested in a feature class, specific properties, in addition, I can click on that. And it has these specific ones like feature type. Is it a simple, you know, simple features, polygons, points, lines, or some other type? Whether it has Z, if it's Z enabled for three, for three D use, for example, if it has a spatial index, most of them already have it built. The shape field name, the name of the geometry field. And that's read only notice, all these are read only. The shape type polygon, the basic tape, shape types. So for example, if I go back here, my last one was X dot data type. It's a feature class, but it also has shape type, X dot shape type polygon. Whereas if I have, because it's going to a feature class, if I have it just going there, that will not have a shape type. Now, if I say X dot shape type, it will say attribute error, it doesn't exist. Why? because the data type of, let's go back up here, of Ottawa Geodatabase slash data, that's a feature data set. It doesn't have a shape type. So the describe object asking for a shape type, it doesn't make any sense because it does not belong to the class that has shape type, which is feature data set or feature class, I should say. So if we look at, instead, if we look at data set or, um, data set properties here, back in the help file, we can go back, look at feature or data set properties, which a feature data set is, it would have the data set type. So maybe I can check that one, I'll try that. X dot data set type, feature data set also has um, extent of the feature data set and some other ones here, the spatial reference. So I can check the space. You can even get the spatial reference from the describe, which is a usual place to get a spatial reference dot spatial reference. That gives me a spatial reference object. So I'd have the space spatial reference, which has its own properties. So I could save that. Like I could say SR equals or SR equals x dot spatial reference, sr dot name, and that's a property, city of Ottawa, dot unit, or um, dot linear unit, sr dot, sr dot 
linear units or unit or units. Oh, I can't remember the, all those properties now off by hand. But if I go back here to the help file, um, and I look at spatial reference, well, I can click on spatial reference and it has its own properties, item, TCS properties down here. Name, you saw a whole bunch of other ones, azimuth, is anything that you would need to for a, a spatial reference, it's here. Doesn't mean every spatial reference has all these things, but they're available. But it's a quick way to get a spatial reference. So the describe object, the properties, it may have an addition depend on the type of object it is. And you have to check them out in the help file. Here's just an example. It's a very, it's very complex looking, so I don't expect you to understand it all, but you should read through this. And I'll just go up quickly. The idea is here, I have a path. And then I have a describe object of the path, right? We know already that that's a feature data set right here. I describe it. And then I can use a whole bunch of if flow control statements here and nested flow control statements to do certain things, you know, based on that data type. So if the data type was a folder or a workspace, then I would describe the workspace type because that's a specific thing for those um, things. And I print it out. Else, if it or else if it is a feature data set or raster data set or table, then I could also get the workspace type as well and describe that the path. So it's just showing examples of flow control based on what type of uh, data set you have on a describe. Here, it, it's not doing anything but printing out things about it, but obviously you can see the idea would be that we, you could use some of a form like this to control analyses depending on the type of data that is put in to a analysis. So sometimes, you know, you might have, you might want to have a dynamic tool that can accept either a raster data set or a um, feature data set, for example. And so you can use describe to say, okay, if it's a raster data set, do this. If it's a feature data set, do that. And have two sets of code in your tool to do so. And so you have a very flexible tool that way. But yes, don't be intimidated by all this. Um, have a look at it, but I don't expect you to follow all that in detail right now. Listing data. There are a number of list functions available in ArcGIS Pro ArcPy. And they're all ArcPy based. So they're all ArcPy.list this, list that. And they don't return to, uh, result objects. Instead, they return certain things. So for example, I could list fields as long as I provide a data set. And that will return a list of fields found in the input. So it's not a result object, but rather a list of fields list indexes, a list of attribute indexes, list data sets, well, a list of data sets. And these are most of the time objects themselves. So field, a list fields will provide a list of field objects. So for example, let's have a look at that. Or should I maybe make a new one? Yeah, let's just move this stuff over here for now, like so. So just now a list, an example of a list field. So I'll, so I'll save my list here. I'll say FLDS equals list fields. And then my data set, I'll say will be features to be clipped. There we go, like so. So I'll just run that. Now FLDS itself is a list object. So for example, I'll just explore it here just in the console. I'll say FLDS zero, what's in there? And it says a field object. So since this is a list of objects, and if I was to iterate over them, for example, let's have a little iteration example here. I'll say for FLD in FLDS print, print FLD like so. So I'll just run this again. And it prints just a whole bunch of things here saying, geoprocessing to describe field object. So to figure out what I could do, instead of printing just objects, maybe I can get the field name. So how about printing FLD 
for each field object, I know if I look at the help file for a field object, for example, if I go back here and I look at, um, uh, where's the list? I'll go to the list field functions, list fields. So the return is a field, list of fields. So a field object, if I go to the field object, then I can look at all the properties that I could then get such as name, for example, here. I'll say list field dot name and I'll run that. So now it lists all the field names for me. Instead of just objects, I'm using the name property of the field to get the name each time when I iterate over the list of fields. Listing feature classes is also straightforward. Let's look at an example of that. So I'll go over here to PyScriptor. So we did the list fields as one of the list examples. Now notice here, this is very important that when I did the arcpy.list fields, all I had to send it was the name of a layer. In this case, truck routes, the features to be clipped that we call that, that's the variable name. And that's because I already have a workspace set. So as long as the workspace has been set, you can use the arcpy.list functions. Let's look, look at listing feature classes. So I'll just call it FCS equals arcpy.list feature classes. Like so. And all we would put in here is a wildcard but in this case, I want a list of everything. So I'll just keep it like that. So if I run that and I check out what the content of FCS is here in my console, it says the following routes in a poly, a buffer routes in a poly A. And why does it say that? Well, if I go back and I look at my geo database right here, just in our GIS pro, and I'll not properties, I wanted to refresh it to make sure we're working with the current version. And there it is inside the Ottawa GDB at the root level of the geodatabase is a buffer, routes in a poly, and routes in a poly A. So it listed all those. So for example, <clears throat> if I wanted to just get the name of one of them, since it's a list object, I could just say FCS equals FCS or not FCS equals, but just FCS zero gives me the first one. FCS one gives me the second one, et cetera. And I could store those in variables and use them if I wanted to. If we change our path to data, which is a featured data set inside the geo database, and then I run it again, and I check out the contents of FCS by just typing it in the console and hit enter, I'll see a much bigger list, which is the list of all the all of the um, feature classes inside FCS. So it's a bunch of them there. And so you can use these functions, right? As long as you've set a workspace. So that's the key thing. And then it lists the things within the workspace. If I go back to just the GDB, I could list feature data sets, for example. Ooh, GDB, there we go. So instead of list feature classes, <clears throat> arc pi dot list feature uh, list data sets, like so. And I'll just run that. And then we'll look at the contents FCS and it should say Ottawa data and data. And there it does. So this way you can check, for example, you know, I could say, for example, for FC or F, uh, feature data set FD in FCS. And then we'll say here, print the arcpy dot list feature classes, I should say feature classes here. So the idea here is I want to iterate over each of the feature data sets to list the feature classes. 
But before I do that listing of the feature classes, I need to set the workspace here to something slightly different, which would be the following. I'll say new WS and here, this is where I'll use my formatting for a string. This will be that slash, I think it's double slashes we're using. And then this thing here. And what will those things be? Well, I want to have dot format. And in the first squiggly brace, I want current the current env dot workspace. And in the second one, then I want the FD, which is the feature data set name. Then I can assign that to the workspace. And I should first, because I'm doing this right, and I want it to go through each one, env.workspace equals new ws, that because I reset the workspace here, now it also, that workspace will have this feature data set only. And then if I try it again for the second time through, what will happen is it will just tack on the next FD and two of those. And that doesn't actually exist in there because I have two feature data sets, Ottawa data and Ottawa. So I need to make a variable out here, which is original WS equals env dot workspace. And then in here, I won't do workspace. I'll just do original workspace like so. That way, the first time it goes through the iteration in this loop, FD will be called data. And this will be the original workspace, double backslash data for the feature data set. Then we set the workspace to that and we list the feature classes. Then the next time through, it becomes Ottawa data. So FD equals Ottawa data, because that's the second thing in the list, the iterable FCS. Here, it puts the original workspace now plus Ottawa data. And then ENV workspace is set, and then we list the feature classes. So let's run that. It'll give me two lists at the end. Move that up a bit so you can see them both. So there's my first list, data, and the second list here for Ottawa data. And maybe I want to have those a bit, you know, that those printouts a bit more um, explicit. So right now, it, you know, I could have multiple, right? So I could have a, a geodatabase with 20 different um, feature data sets in it with multiple feature classes in each one. So perhaps here in my print statement, I want to say which feature data set that list belongs to. So I'll use a print statement for that. So I open my quotes again, quote, it's frozen here for a second. There we go. So just quote, double quote. And in here, I'm going to say squiggly brace colon squiggly brace dot format or oh, does that dot format and in the first squiggly brace I want to put FD for the feature data set name and then comma archpy dot list feature classes and we'll just run it again and you'll see immediately oh, um, line 24 way down here what's going on I missed a parentheses or something let's just see here that one and one more parentheses there we go and we'll run that there so now it says data colon this and then ottawa data colon that and i could be more fancy with that obviously um, the feature data set that contains these FCs for feature classes, FCS. So I could run it again. And then it just makes it a little bit more like so. And I might even want to put a new line after the, at the end of this. So I could say slash N. So backslash N for new line. That's usually the new line character. Let's see how that works out. There. So that just formats it a bit nicer in the printout at the bottom. I have a space now between or an extra line between each one. So it makes it easier to see. 
So it says the feature data set data contains these feature classes. The feature data set Ottawa data contains these ones. So let's just list data sets. It provides simply a list of data sets, which is in this case, a list of strings, right? FCS is just a string with the two feature data sets in that geodatabase. And then for each one, since we know the names of them, we tack them onto the env.workspace just using string formatting. So env.workspace goes in there and then two backslashes and then in here, the name of the feature data set. And that makes of course a string that would look like that. Or in the second case, Ottawa data. So, and we list all the things in there so we can get the names right or search for cer certain names or anything like that that we can use functions for. So listing feature classes. So again, the important thing, you can't list, use the arcpy.list functions unless you've set the workspace. And for some of them, um, for example, list fields, you have to set the workspace and the feature class at the same time. Or no, you don't have, well, you have to set the workspace, but you have to send it a feature class. So list feature classes, we didn't send an argument to, so we wanted them all listed. But when we did it with the, and I've already taken it away there, but if you recall, when we did it with the, the list um, fields, we had to put the name of the data set in the parentheses. Listing workspaces. So we can do the same thing. We can list workspaces for any path. And there's an example there. I won't go through it, it's pretty straightforward. You could try it on your own. And I, you need to do that to understand how that works. So listing workspaces anywhere. So workspaces are folders or geodatabases. And listing fields, uh, you've seen the example of that. And again, try those. Now, one of the things that was different is some of the list functions like list feature data sets, list feature classes, simply return strings, which are the names of the objects. Whereas list fields, and I, I explained that, is a list of objects. So we have to then, we had to go look at the field value or the field um, uh, help file to figure out what the properties of it are so that we know how to manipulate it or get information about it, such as field names. So anything that lists objects, you have to look at the return value so in a help file, going back to that help file, and where was that help file? There it is here. So for example, here, this was a field and we were looking at the list fields function. So list fields always tells you the return value. All any function will have a return value specified somewhere. And then here it says the type of thing, the data type is field. So that's what it's returned. And that means that's another object. That's different from when it, something returns like a string, for example. A field object means it has its own properties and methods. It encapsulates in that object things about itself and things it can do. So I had to go to field to look at that. And that's where we found things like all the, like the, the name, for example, the, the path, the type, et cetera. So whenever something returns objects and not strings, if you just print out the object itself, it will just say object at object at, like we just saw here, field object at field object at. And you might be confused by that, but if you see something like that, that means you're working with an object, not a standard data type. And so you have to then look at the object help file to see what properties you could then get from it. Working with lists. So this is just a reminder from lecture one. So there's nothing new here, but recall with lists, um, a lot of these list functions, listing things and lists are very commonly needed and used and manipulated with ArcPy. So it could be a list of layers that go into an analysis or that you wanna clip, let's say hundred layers to the same extent, then you'd have to work with lists. 
and there's different ways again, um, you know, how many things do you find in a list? You can count them. You can append new things to a list. <clears throat> you can extend a list with a list of things that will go in there. You can get the index of some object or name in the list. You can remove things from the list. So a lot of different things you can do with lists. So this is a quick reminder. So for example, get a count of the number of fields in a feature class. You can use the length Python function. So let's say we just wanted to know the number of, um, the number of fields in a particular feature class or in each feature class here, for example. Well, firstly, I'd have to get a describe object on each one. And then from there, I'd have to get the field list or list fields or I could just list fields straight out on each of the objects. So there's a couple of ways we could go about it. One is through describe, which would give us names of the fields only, or through the list fields function, which will give us field objects. And if all we care about is the number of fields in each um, layers feature class, well, we can just put it right here in our loop, right? So here, for example, um, we have our we start up here with our list data sets, FCS. And then we go into our loop for each data set. We say, okay, we make a new workspace to switch to the feature data set first in the list the first time through. So that's data. And here now we're just printing out stuff on the bottom line there. We're saying print, and I'll make that on a couple lines here. Like so, that should work. Let's just check. Yeah, like so. I just want to run that to make sure that's uh, recognized in here. Yeah, that's good. If I don't have it, what will happen is same thing. So it doesn't care about the white space. Some editors, yeah, I have to explicitly put the um, separator or a new line separator. So here we go, that prints that. I just put it on two lines so it's easy to, to see. Maybe I should put that on like so. And if I run it like that, yeah, still works fine. And I might just wanna put that in a bit. Oh no, we don't wanna do that. So here we're listing the feature classes. So instead of printing out this statement, what I wanna do in here is get a list of the feature classes, and then for each feature class, figure out the length of, or the number of fields in each feature class. So I'm gonna then here list feature classes now. So I'm gonna say, since I've set my workspace to the feature data set, right? I'll save my list instead of just putting it in a print statement. And it's just, um, there we go. It's hard to see the cursor. So in here, I'll say um, FC list equals lit arcpy dot list feature classes, like so. Then for each feature class, I will get a list of the fields, but I'll do that in a, another iterator. Since I have a list here, I need to iterate over it. So I'll say for FC in FC list, so that gives me FC now will be a feature class name, which I can list the field from. So I can say here, right under there, list, oops, there we go. And I'll store the list, um, F-L-D-L-I-S-T equals arcpy dot list fields. And then in the list fields, I have to specify which feature class and that's FC. Because remember the list of feature classes is right here. And so that looks like that, just names. And we know it's in that workspace. And so I can use arcpy.list fields with just sending 
each name, such as FC, which is the iterator variable, which takes on each value in that list, like airports, and then crime, and then facilities. And so I just put it here with list fields. Now I have my field list. And now I could print some information. I could say, okay, let's uh, print, for example, here, I'll print the field name. And I'll start by making quotes and then squiggly brace contains squiggly brace fields, period. And then out of the quotes, I'll say dot format. And in here, for the first part, I'll say FC. Um, hold on, yeah, FC feature class, list the fields. Yeah, so FC, the feature feature class contains len, length, FLD, list. So len is a built-in function for length of a string, a list, or any object that can have length. And so the length of the field list is how many fields there are. And that's why I'm saying this feature class FC will go here. Feature class contains uh, the length of field list, number of fields. Maybe make it more explicit. And let's run that and see the list. Notice how it comes and it's checking all of them. So, well, paths and trails has 44 fields. Uh, well, DA contains 251. Well, that doesn't make sense. 251 number of fields, 251 fields. I think it was better the way it was before, just like so. So I can rerun that. So there we go. We now have a script which lists the number of fields in every single feature class in all the feature data sets. But here, I don't, I don't know which ones are in which feature data set. So I should probably add a little bit more to this. So I could say here another squiggly brace for the feature data set squiggly brace containing feature class. So I need to put in here the current FD feature data set. So I can tell which is from which feature data set. So I put here, I'll make this on two lines before I do that. So I'll just put a format. So I'm just printing. There's my print state, my print statement. And here in the first uh, squiggly braces, I want to put FD, the feature data set. And then the feature class contains that many fields. So now I know which, which, uh, which feature data set each of the um, counts and feature classes belong to. So it's just a way to print those out. And that's it, that by itself is a handy tool or a handy script by itself that could be made into a, stand, into a tool in ArcGIS to quickly list features, feature data sets or the number of fields in feature classes contained in a geodatabase feature data set. Why would, you, why would you even want to do this? You're probably thinking, well, the type of scenario in which something like this could be useful, and there's many other ones, is that you're working for an organization and you find that you have to homogenize the currency, that's the, the dates of data across a number of ArcGIS Pro projects. And so you, one of the layers or a few of the layers in some of them, but not in all of them, would contain, let's say for schools, might have 13 fields because it's the old data set. And the current data set for schools is 14 fields. So by creating and iterating over them like this, you can find out which uh, layers called school contain 13 or 14, 13 data set, 13 uh, fields. And then you could replace them. Those data set, the, uh, the data that it's pointing to with um, the new schools data set. 
And that would just mean adding in before the print statement certain things such as, okay, if F C equals schools, uh, let's see how it's spelled there, schools, yeah. Then print out this stuff and I'd have to indent that like so. So notice how we have two nested for loops and then we even have some flow control in there. So now only things which are school will be printed out. So it's going through them all, checking them. And when it finds the feature class that is the same as schools, it prints only that one out. And again, you may have, you may be iterating over a number of, um, a number of different geodatabases for that, for example, to find those ones. So that's like an, a, the idea of automation. So scripting for automation or um, just to do things quickly that would take you otherwise a long time to manually go and check each geo database if you had 100 of them or so to make sure that they had current, um, the current uh, schools layer was being referenced. So that's just kind of a scenario. Um, there's other ones as well, but we can't spend all our time just talking about scenarios. For next week, uh, chapters five and six, and completing of exercise two. And again, remember that exercise two and what we've gone through in this lecture are together. So you must go through this material, understand it before going through the example exercises. And some might be repeated for, because that means they're important, really important, before you go and look at the actual um, exercise itself um, in order to completely be able to answer the questions at the end.